Open your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 4. I trust if you haven't turned in your, your card for faith promise that you are praying about it. Matthew chapter 4. You know, I've known of a number of missionaries over the years that are in Brazil, but when you think of the size of the nation, that's, that's amazing. Can you imagine, uh, he, he talks about towns or cities of 100 plus thousand. Can you imagine living in a place like that and there's no gospel witness at all? I mean, none. You know, we, I think sometimes it's hard for us to grasp what some, what the majority of the world lives like as far as their exposure to the gospel. And really it's amazing how God can take a couple and direct them not only to a land, but, but I mean right down to the very area in that country where he wants them to serve. Especially when I think of the Shoals, they were the first ones in, in Greenland. We know a couple that was, the, they were the first couple to go into Kazakhstan. And just the mountain of paperwork. I remember Brother Chris, I, I think they were in Ireland for a while just trying to get uh, the needed paperwork to get into Greenland. And, uh, and then to get in there and the translation that he had to do after working on the language. It's amazing what some will, what they will accomplish, what they'll do just to be able to present the gospel to people. Thank God for their dedication. But you know what? Tonight I want to speak to you. Okay? And uh, let's read in Matthew 4, and we'll pick up in verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said, saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Father, we thank you for each one that's here tonight, how already the, the message of song has uh, both blessed and challenged our hearts. We appreciate the Johnsons and uh, since their excitement about their soon departure for Brazil. We pray that you'll just guide them in the days ahead. Be with Mrs. Johnson as she studies the language, and we pray that you'd make it easier, easy for her to learn. We ask now that you'll use the, the verses we'll look at tonight to uh, challenge us. From thy word we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I didn't realize tonight I could speak so many languages. I mean, I understood what she was playing in all the different languages she was playing. Wasn't that neat? That's really a dumb joke. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> I want us to, you know, we've looked Sunday morning at, at the verse for the week or uh, the, the theme of the week, even so send I you. That's John 20, 21. And then also Matthew 28, 19, and 20. We know that's part of another, uh, another passage that deals with the Great Commission. There's Mark 16, verse 15, Luke 24, verses 46 through 48. And then last night we looked at Acts 1, verse 8. And all of these really, they deal with that same commission that the Lord gave the disciples. And, and as we saw last night, it's for us as well. But, you know, the, the men and those that he, he gave that commission to, that first generation, it's not like that was the beginning for them. You know, they actually had been with the Lord for a while, and there was much that he had taught them. 
has the Lord taught you anything? And I mean, as far as uh, his, what he can do in your life and, and just what he's, uh, his, some of his abilities and how he can use you. I'm sure he has, but, you know, I, I, I want to look tonight. I wish there were time to, to look at a lot more, but there, there aren't. Uh, but I want to look tonight at this thought of where the Lord really started with these men. And, you know, there's a starting point in your life and my life, not, not just for salvation. Now, granted, salvation's instant. The moment we uh, turn to Christ and turn to Christ from sin, yeah, we, we trust Christ and we're, we're saved instantly. We know that. But that's also a starting point. But sometimes even later on in our, our Christian life, there are things that begin to, to, to be real to us, realizing some of the responsibilities we have as a Christian. You know, we don't just get everything right. I want to be careful how to say this. You're completely saved at the moment of conversion. We know that. You're, you have everything you need, just like the child when you bring a child home from the hospital. Uh, that, that newborn, they... They have all the body parts. I mean, it's not like you go back after a couple of weeks and, and get, you know, the legs, the hand, and this kind of thing. They're, they're complete. And in the same way, when we're born again, when we're birthed into the family of God, we have everything. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have a new nature. And, and we have, from the first day, the wonderful opportunity for the first time in our life to fellowship with God. Okay, but I, I see here with these men, these four men mentioned here, there were others later, but I see as the Lord comes along, He just really, he, well, it's the calling on them. He calls them. And He says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Now we know from the passage they, they were fishermen already. That's what they did for their business. But I want to try to kind of take some of the, the truths we see here and then apply them in our lives, especially in this matter of becoming a fisher of men. It's good to hand out tracts. We ought to. And it's wonderful that you're involved in faith promise. But you see, the responsibility, the human responsibility for the growth of this ministry is really on your shoulders. Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, we've got the pastor. Well, yeah, yeah uh, you've got a great pastor, but uh, God wants to use you. And that's something we need to understand here. Uh, you know, I look at this and I see that the Lord picked ordinary men. Actually, there's nothing in Scripture that tells, them, tells us of any outstanding natural talent that they ha had or any uh, special in intellectual abilities. They had no theological training, uh, and unlike Paul, Paul did, and uh, also Nicodemus, who, who had some theological training he had to overcome. And, you know, something else, as you follow through the Gospels, they weren't perfect men. In fact, in Luke 24, the Lord really rebuked them and it called them slow learners. That's another way to say thick-headed. Of course, we don't have anybody here that's thick-headed other than me. I mean, do you ever, you see the Lord's trying to teach you something and you realize, I seem to be going through this class over and over again. I just can't quite grasp this thing. But, but anyway, uh, and there were two sets of brothers here. We don't know much about Andrew. We know a lot about his brother Peter because Peter was the vocal one. Uh, but anyway, so we don't necessarily know a lot about these men other than they were the men that the Lord Jesus started with. And when he came by, uh, again, that follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, you know, in the same way with you and me, I think we need to come to the point to realize do you know what? Jesus Christ can transform me, not just from a sinner to, to a, a, a saint, 
But you know what? In, in that work also, he can transform me into a fisher of men. By nature, I'm timid. Really <laughs> am. Uh, quit seeing your English because I was going to have to give uh, a, a two or three minute speech in front of the whole class. And I knew everybody in the class, but just the thought of getting up in front of people, I thought, I can't do it. I actually, I'm not proud of it. I wasn't saved, but I quit senior, uh, I quit senior English. So I didn't graduate the year I was supposed to. I had to go back the next year, take English, and then they plugged in a couple other things just so I'd be there at least half a day, you know, which was dumb. And even then, uh, I shouldn't tell you this, but I, I really, I really, uh, my English teacher, I mean, I, somehow I finagled her that the speech I was supposed to give in front of the class, I sat down one day at a table and just gave it to her right across the table. Never had to stand up in front of the class. And uh, she passed me. But uh, anyway, but the thing is, I'm, I'm timid. Now, if we go somewhere, my wife isn't. She's outgoing. And I, I wish I were that way naturally. I'm not. And so this is one thing I've had to overcome over the years, especially in talking with people. People I know, it's not, not the issue. People I don't know to strike up a conversation, sometimes, oftentimes, it's difficult. And so when... When this, this thing is, as far as becoming a fisher of men, it, it's not, and I don't mean to downplay, it's not just the giving out gospel tracts, which we should. And, and it's great when we can give out in a whole neighborhood or something like that. But do you know what? You and I should go after individuals. We ought to have some people on our heart that need Christ. And we desire, not in any kind of a boastful way, but we want to be that human instrument that God uses to bring them to Christ. And you know, when we say, well, you know, I couldn't do something like that. Look at what this verse says. And it's an open invitation for you and for me. I see in the verse there's a response required on, by us. Uh, he, we're called on, first of all, to focus on Him. He says, follow me. And we're to learn of Him. We're to learn of His burden. What is His burden? His burden's to, to save those that you know, that I know. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We sometimes, we, we have the thought, well, yeah, I know he does, but boy, so-and-so, they're such a hard-hearted person. I mean, they could never get saved. How do you know that? How do I know that? We don't. So we need to learn of him, and we need to learn that if we're going to follow him, that means we're going to obey him. It means that now there's someone else directing my life other than me. To obey him, to take seriously his claims on my life. Matthew 28, verse 20. Look at that verse just for a second, right at the end of, of Matthew here. Again, a passage that we know well. We, we might know it by heart, or we, at least we, we know it when it's quoted. Verse 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. But now look at this, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Well, wait a minute. What has he teaching them to observe all things? Do we know that? Do we know what he's taught? How can I teach something that I don't know? You see, so I have to have time with the Lord. And Matthew 11, the Lord says, Come unto me, all you that, uh, that uh, labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you, you, you rest. Take my yoke upon you and what? Learn of me. It's good to know. Uh, <clears throat> it's good to know a lot of things, but 
What do you know about your Savior? What do you know about, and really it comes down to the doctrine of Christ, but also what do you know about what He can do in an individual's life? You see, and so the response requires us to follow him, and we cannot follow him unless we leave other things. Look back again there in Matthew chapter 4. It says uh, in verse uh, 22, And immediately they left the ship and their father and followed him. Do you know if you're going to follow Christ, there are going to be some things you leave. You'll have to. He can't be priority in your life and your life be just exactly as it is right now. You know, when you make that choice that, hey, I, I want this to be real in my life. I want my life to count for Christ. I want to be an instrument in his hands that can that through me there can be individuals seen uh, coming to Christ well this can't be done unless there's something that changes in my life and most of the time it means there would be need to be some things that just have to drop off with these men it was the boats it was even fam family and I'm not talking about you going to a foreign field. If God calls that, you ought to. But I, I'm talking about right here again. What do you need to put out of your life to have time to really be used of God to personally win somebody to Christ? Pastor, we're just so busy. I mean, I, I just don't see when I could. I guarantee you, if you begin to make it a matter of prayer, God would show you how you could rearrange your life and, and perhaps really set some things, uh, the priorities in your life and make the changes in your life to be able to take time every week to really seek out somebody to lead them to Christ. Uh, so there's a response that's needed. And, and again, we can't follow him unless we do decide to leave some things behind. And you know, that's the thing too. When we claim to be a follower of Christ, you know, that's one of the expressions that, that we can use to describe our walk with Christ or, or, or being a Christian. But if I'm going to be a follower, then this is part of being the follower. We're yielding to him so that he can make us fishers of men. So there's, there's a, a response that's required by us. And then when we yield to that, there is also a transforming work accomplished by him. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, in our church, we've had classes and things like that, sometimes in Sunday school, go through, uh, you know, ways you can speak to somebody and, uh, you know, about the Lord and begin to witness to them one-on-one -on -one and things like that. But, and I, I, I don't mean this in a, in a criticism of the classes, there's no greater teacher than the Lord himself. Because you know what? He doesn't just give you technique. Do you know what he does? He'll move in your heart. And you won't just be giving a classroom to a sinner. The Lord will put the burden in your heart for that individual. We've got a, a fellow that uh, he lives actually just as close as from here to the uh, the main road out there from our church. And about 20 years ago, it's hard to believe, uh, you know, the first couple of years he and his wife would come some, but his father-in-law was, I mean, a strong Catholic and had influence over, over the wife, you know, the, his the man's daughter, and uh, he told them 
most definitely you do not go down to that Baptist church. And so well, I, well, I would see them out sometimes and, and talk with them sometimes. And I remember one time with the two of them, we're just talking outside, and, and I asked her point blank, I said, what, what does the Catholic Church tell you about how you can know for certain you're going to heaven when you leave this life? She admitted to me. It didn't. And I said, I won't, I won't call her name because, uh, you know, but anyway, I said, what the, why, what's the purpose of church? Why are you going? Isn't part of, of what we go to church for to, to learn how to come into a right relationship with God or, or to be ready to meet God after this life? And they leave you with that kind of uncertainty? Well, anyway, and then time would go. We'd see them they, out walking their dogs and seeing things like that. And, and so we would chat with them, uh, always inviting them. They knew the door was open. About, actually, I guess it's been a month or so ago, there was a, a note that had been slid under the front door of the church on a Sunday when, when we got there and, and somebody gave me the note and uh, it was from the wife and she told me, she said that her husband was down in, in Baltimore and he had uh, an advanced stage of leukemia and just asked that the church pray for him. So anyway, uh, I, she had her cell phone on there so I, I contacted her and got more details about it. And I don't know if it was the next, but within the couple of days, I went down to see him, and uh, he had already been in treatment for a month, and his numbers hadn't changed at all. And they weren't really given a whole lot of hope for him. And uh, so anyway, we, we chatted for a while, and you know, the sad part, he told me then, he said, you know, over the years, especially, he said, after 9-11, uh, he said, they just really didn't want to go anywhere for a while and some things like that. And, but he said, you know, even, even my wife, who was raised Catholic, he said, even my wife knows that what they teach is wrong. And he said, we believe what you say, and which, which would be the Bible. He said, we believe that's the truth. And so even then, I just just talking with him about things. But uh, anyway, so he he still he's still not saved, you know. And don't know how long he has. I don't know. Uh, I talked to him today. Uh, he actually did, he was home for a couple of days, and uh, so I, I talked with him, and he said that he goes back tomorrow to find out about the numbers, you know, where things are. And he said, but the, they've already told him to bring a suitcase. When he goes down, he's, he stays there for the treatments and things. But, uh, but anyway, you know, uh, I hate that it might be at the end. And he's a young guy. Of course, young is relative. Some of you would think he's old. Me, I think he's very young. You know, but, but anyway, uh, you know, I, I want to see, I want to see him, I want to see him make sure that he's placed his trust in Christ. And you know, I'm, I, I, yeah, I, there, there are a couple of guys that <clears throat> right now that, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to, to reach out to another one is mid-30s. And, you know, when you're twice somebody's age, I mean, there's not a whole lot in common, but still, he's got a great need in his life. And I'm not, I'm not holding myself up at all, but I want to challenge you. Each of us should have people like that. Granted, I, I've got family members I'm concerned about, but... But there are other people as well. And you know, there are people out there that, that the verse in Psalm, I think it's 142, 
they really could fit that verse where, where David said, I looked on my right hand and beheld refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. You and I know unsaved people that really nobody really cares about. They may say they love them, but there's nobody that's concerned about their spiritual need. And you and I can be the individual that God uses to reach them. But anyway, we see that if we're going to do that, then we have to allow the Lord to do that transforming work. Now, once again, there are times that in my own life, the Lord, I'll be out somewhere and He'll impress upon me to, to talk to a person. And I hate to say it, but I struggle with it. I do. But I mean, I, I try and obey Him. Uh, was in a situation this morning. First thing, I had to go in and buy a car battery. And so I was in an auto parts place and uh, I, I walked up to the, uh, the counter and there was a, a fella that by the facial hair, he was obviously a man, but his hair was down about to here. Uh, he had ladies' uh, garments on and uh, had a little mini skirt, wearing a mini skirt. And uh, I, I, my first thought was I mean, you know, I can't believe this. This is, you know, just really a couple of miles from my house, I'm, you know. But, and, and I, but I said, Dear God, help me with my expression. My wife tells me all the time, you got to fix your face. I mean, so apparently, I, you know, I, I can read things in my face. But, you know, I thought, don't let, me, don't, don't let me express myself in a way that would make him hostile right away. Okay. And, uh, but anyway, I hate to admit it, but I, I didn't even give him a track. For one, I, didn't, I had a sweatshirt on. I didn't have one with, but I had to come back, and I, I, I forgot it. I really did forget it. But, you know, I want to make it a point to go back. You know, I mean, it's gone through my mind. Well, what if, what if you know, then he comes out to the church, and then it's a problem because, you know, of what he'll hear at the church. You know, the Lord can handle those things. The young man, and he is a young man, even though he's trying not to be, he needs Christ in his life. And, you know, that's the thing, too. Sometimes people we come into contact with, uh, right off the bat, they, they might not look like prime, uh, prime individuals to become members of a church. Do you understand what I'm saying? They, they, don't look, they don't look like Christians. Well, a lot of Christians, a lot of people out there that need to get saved don't look like Christians. I don't know if that made sense, but I, I know what I'm trying to say without saying a whole lot of things there. I mean, they're, you know, just the way some of the people look. Well, anyway, we'll leave it there. But anyway, He enables us. You know, when, when we learn of Him, do you know what He does help us to do? He enables us to get our eyes off herself and look at others. There's a song, Let Me See This World, Dear Lord, as though I were looking through your eyes. When, when we stop seeing somebody and and see how they look so different, but understand that behind all that outer whatever's going on, inside there's, there's a soul that's going to spend eternity somewhere. And you know what? It's a soul that the blood of Christ was shed, that they could have forgiveness of sin. So when we follow Him, we learn of Him, and when we learn of Him, He will actually change our attitude toward unsaved people. He can. As I said last night, I, I, here in our country, we have a tendency, though we try and bury it, we have a tendency of being prejudiced 
against one group or another. We do. And yet, as a Christian, we need to understand that, that Christ died for the world. And He can save anybody. You know, the guy that led me to the Lord, uh, he was an electrician, never finished the eighth grade. And uh, it was something, after, after he led me to Christ, he, he began to try and disciple me, and, and he didn't know a whole lot. He taught me about tithing. And then sometimes he, he'd wanted to show me something, and he'd try and read the, the verses to me, but couldn't pronounce a lot of the words, so I would read it uh, for him. But I look back, I mean, I appreciated it some then, but I look back as I begin to, to grow, and then especially going out as a missionary, and so grateful that he took the time with me that he did to try and help me get grounded as far as a, as a Christian. And you know, you, each of us can do that. Say, well, and that's another thing. Sometimes we, we get somebody to come to church and then it's like, okay, I'm done. No, not really. I, 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 I want to step over here for just a second with something. You know, a lot of times when a person gets saved, they lose all their friends. Now, maybe that wasn't the case with you. Uh, it was the case with me. I mean, when I got, when I got saved, the, the, the people other than my dear wife, she still hung around and, and trusted the Lord herself. And, but, you know, uh, the, the people that we had known, we, we didn't have any friends anymore. I mean, it wasn't like we, you know, were really, I don't know, all upset about it. But still, it, it's like there's a vacuum in the life, in a person's life. And you know what? That's when they need to know that they're Christians that care and you know, invite them over. Spend some time with them. You know, and help them begin to understand what it is to be a Christian. But, but anyway, uh, if we respond, and there is a response required, and then there is a transforming work that the Lord can do in our life, and then, you know, when I consider some of the things like the illustration used, you know, God used just what these men would understand. They were fishermen. And He says, Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. There are other places where he speaks of the harvest and laborers and things like that. You know, the Lord can show you things. He can teach you spiritual truth from things that you, you're more familiar with. He can use things in your life to illustrate spiritual truth. But these men as fishermen, they, they understood some things. When he said you can become a fisher of men, they knew what it was to be a fisherman. They knew the labor that it took. They knew the courage that it took sometimes to, to be out at sea, even in times of storm. They knew the persistence that was needed. They knew what it was like because on several occasions, you know what, they fished all night and caught nothing. That's kind of like going out one Saturday on visitation and you really can't even talk to anybody about, the Lord, about, about, about the Lord. You leave a couple of tracks, and I mean, that seems to be it. Well, you know, I'm not going to do that anymore. You understand what I'm saying? They knew what it meant to be persistent. If, if you were saved after, uh, you know, in, uh, say after uh, 20 years old, uh, did, did you come to Christ with the first person that talked to you? When I was in the Navy out in California, I remember uh, there was one little, uh, 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 well, a plaza, a park, a square plot park. And uh, we'd go out there sometimes on a Friday night. As we're going downtown, we'd go past it, uh, a bunch of us off, off the ship. And, and uh, you could see Harry Krishna on this corner, and you could see somebody else over here, and, and some different religion on each corner. And I can remember at times somebody coming up and wanting to hand me something, and I didn't take it. I'd tell them no. It wasn't that I was atheist or anything like that, but you know what my fear was? Getting involved in something that wasn't right. That was it. And I don't think I'm the only human that's walked on this planet 
that it's not that I don't want the Lord in my life. I'm, I feared getting involved. I had enough sense to know there were, there were teachings out there that weren't right. And that was all I wanted. I wanted to make sure that whatever I, I began to learn about was truth. You know, we can be persistent. And one way you can show somebody that what you have is true is by allowing Christ to shine through you. Things that we, we know and just seem, uh, I don't know, uh, just too simple, but they, they aren't that simple. You see people today at that, I mean, just like a light switch. Their mood changes. They can get so explosive. They can get so upset. It's so different when somebody around them has uh, just a, a stability about them, a peace about them. You know, even that's a great testimony a calmness about them. But anyway, uh, if, we, if we consider some things here, do I understand that really this verse speaks of a foundational truth for the Christian? I look at the, the different uh, verses that deal with the Great Commission and as we looked last night at Acts 1, verse 8, we could look at all of them. We see that, that those come down through the generations to us. They come down to the church, and we're members of churches, and so that means it comes to us. And right here again, the Lord individually says, Hey, if you'll really follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. If you follow me, and I'm not talking about a, a, a ten minute, a ten second prayer or whatever, and, and they're in. I'm talking about this thing of seeing people truly uh, birthed into the family of God. If you'll follow me, I can accomplish that in you. And so to understand that, and if I don't, then you know, following Christ. In the Christian life, it, it's not really, uh, uh, what do you call it, like a, a buffet meal. You know, I'll, I'll take this, but I don't want this. And I, I like the security. I like the, especially Romans chapter 8. I love the verses in Romans 8, but, but I don't really like the idea of Romans 6 where he talks about presenting yourself. Or Romans 12 where it's to present your body, your life. A living sacrifice. I'm not crazy about that. I'm going to leave that here on the buffet. The Christian life isn't like that. We need to really just sell out to the Lord. And again, I'm not talking about if God leads you to a foreign field, that's wonderful. But this church needs some Christians that are really sold out to the good Lord. Some of you have been in other churches, and if you, you look at them, uh, not being judgmental, but do you know what you see? You can see that there are some, they'll come and things like that, but you, you know there's really a smaller percentage that really help to move that ministry, humanly speaking, move that ministry forward. And that needs to be you. But anyway, and so, uh, and, and I'll, I'll close with this. I didn't mean to go this long, but uh, as I read that verse, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Am I a fisher of men? Or would I have to confess this area of my Christian life is deficient? In other words, no, I'm, I'm not actively pursuing the lost individually. I'm more like the disciples in John 4 when they rushed into the village, got something to eat, and came back out. And that lady fought, went in after them and brought out a crowd. Am I one that just, I rush in and I rush by? 
you know, I'm the one in Walmart that uh, I go to the uh, self checkout so I can get in and out. And but at the same time, then I don't get an opportunity to even speak to the uh, a cashier. Well, that's because they're only two on duty anyway. But uh, but still, am I deficient in this area? And if if you would say, yes, I am. Are you willing to let the Lord change you? It's that simple. You know, tonight the Lord says, if you'll follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. Not overnight, but I'll make you a fisher of men. And, and you'll really begin to grasp and have the conviction of the Great Commission. But right here, and when you hear about families coming in that, and they've seen people saved in, in Brazil or wherever it might be, not in a proud way, but you'll rejoice because you really have a heart for souls and it shows because you have people on your heart that are lost that you're trying to win to Christ. We could go back to, through the verses. It won't take time. But, you know, I'll close with this. You know, um, we've got a young lady. She's about 25 years old. Um, and she's a single mom. Uh, she, she just recently trusted Christ as Savior, was, was baptized. And uh, she was telling me, I guess it's been a couple of weeks ago, she, she delivers food. That's, that's the job she has right now, trying to get something else. But anyway, she said she dropped some food off at a house, and as she pulled up to the house, the music was so loud, and she said, of all things, it was whoever was singing uh, the, the group, it's who she used to listen to before she got saved. And so as she's pulling in, she, all, her whole thought was, I need to get out of here as quick as I can. She said she rushed the food up and, and dropped it off and was trying to get out of there. And she got back to the car. And she said, you know, it dawned on her. She needed to leave them a gospel track. So here's a, a small little 25-year-old girl, well, lady. Uh, but just she goes back up, and it's three guys there anyway. But she told him, she said, I, you know, I used to listen to that. I don't now. She gave him a track, and they kind of scoffed at her. But when she told us about it, she was talking to Judy and I, it, it wasn't the fact that they scoffed. She, that didn't really... The thing is, what, what broke her heart was she said, they're They're lost. And she said, I didn't know how to convince them that what I have is real. And in so many words, that's what she was saying. You know, and as I listened to her, I thought, dear God, make it real like that in my life again. To where it's not just professional, where it's not just uh, habitual that just will hand out a track, but that, that you see people the way the Lord does. You see them as lost and, and really just a heartbeat from hell. And to realize I may be the last one. I may be the last person that can reach out to this individual for Christ. And may we learn to take a few moments so that God could use us in that way. Are you a fisher of men?